I'm grateful for your presence here this morning. Great to see all of you, and we are ready to begin our Bible classes. Other classes are meeting as well, and just glad that you are here, and hope that you will um, come to our Bible class every Lord's Day at 930, um, and uh, we promise not to change the time every week, okay? <laughs> so... Uh, uh, I'm not feeling a little tired yet, but this usually usually hits me harder now that I'm a little older, uh, and uh, so it, uh, it it'll hit me throughout the week probably. Uh, but anyway, um, hope you all got a good night's rest. And I tried to go to bed a little bit earlier last night, and and and, and I did. But uh, good to see you all. Turning your Bibles to the Book of Daniel as we are beginning, really looking at the text today. Last week we had an introduction. Uh, to the book of Daniel. I have some of those introductory notes uh, back there when you're kind of walking in and make the, the turn there. Um, and if you want to get one of those, I think I have five or six copies or something like that if you want that. But um, there was some good information there uh, concerning Daniel and who he is. Uh, today, we uh, and, and by the way, in that introduction, there is an outline um, that I'm pretty much going to follow in, uh, in this study. And so uh, according to that outline, based on that outline, you can divide the first chapter into, into three basic parts. And so that's what we're doing um, today. We're looking at chapter one. We're going to go to God in prayer and ask you to bow your heads with me for just a, a few minutes. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we could be together this morning. We thank you for everyone who uh, is here and who has made that important choice. We thank you for the blessings of life that allow us to be here. We give you uh, the praise for these things, for our automobiles and for the clean clothes and uh, the breakfast that we've had this morning or coffee. Or uh, Father, we thank you that we have the ability to get cleaned up and, and be here and be in this comfortable environment this morning. Father, we thank you for Daniel, and we pray that we will live our lives like he lived his, even though our circumstances are not exactly the same. No matter, the principles and the truths by which he lived are applicable uh, to us today. Thank you, Father, for his example, and may we be an example to those who follow us in life, uh, to our children, grandchildren, friends, and family members and all those that we come into contact with, may they see uh, our character and our faith as we see uh, in Daniel. Thank you, Father, for this time of Bible study. And thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus, whom we want to follow, whom we believe in, and through whom is our salvation and hope of eternal life. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. The, the first chapter of Daniel, we are really introduced to really some very important background which will tell us why Daniel is where he is and gives us some, uh, some insights into his age and into his power and his character and his faith. Uh, the first chapter is the first chapter for a reason because it gives us important uh, information about Daniel and who he is. We're going to look here at verses 1 through 7 to start off with. We're going to look at this uh, book verse by verse. Uh, we won't look at everything. Um, you, you really wouldn't be able to call this an exhaustive study. But it will be... Um, uh, exhaustive enough, I think, for our purposes. So we're looking at the first couple of verses and we're calling this Daniel carried away to Babylon. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasury house of his God. Then the king instruct, instructed Ashpenaz, 
the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. All right, so that's the first seven verses. Notice here, and this helps us to identify the period of time that we're talking about in this, third, in this first verse. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Israel, or to Jerusalem, and besieged it. Let's at least note a couple of things about Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim became king of the southern kingdom in 609 B.C., or thereabout. About 609 B.C., three months after the death of his father, Josiah. Josiah reigned for a number of years. I I don't remember exactly uh, how long, but he was, sometimes he is referred to even today in literature as good king Josiah, and he was a good and faithful king. Jehoiakim was his son, and he reigned about 11 years in the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom, you remember, is referred to as Judah. The northern kingdom is referred to as what? Uh, As Israel, okay? The northern kingdom of Israel. At this time, Israel is basically no more. Israel was taken into captivity by the Assyrians approximately 200 years prior to that. 200 years in biblical time doesn't seem all that long. In our time, it is. The United States of America is just over 200 years old. And, uh, you know, 1776 seems such a, a long time ago in our frame of reference. In the great scheme of things, it's not really... Not really that long. But Israel had went into Assyrian captivity. Uh, sometimes people will refer to the lost tribes of Israel, and they are referring primarily to 10 of the 12 tribes that went into the northern kingdom, established the northern kingdom under their first king, Jeroboam, who was a wicked and terrible king. In fact, all of the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom, were were bad and idolatrous kings. All of them. Okay, The southern kingdom, not as bad. Jehoiakim uh, was not a good king. Okay, Um, And Manasseh was not a good king. But you did have some good kings of the southern kingdom, Josiah being one of them, and Hezekiah being another one. What made these kings bad in the eyes of the Lord is that they were idolatrous. They led the people into idolatry, and God will hold them accountable, and did hold them accountable, uh, most of them, during their lifetime. So Jehoiakim reigned for 11 years, about 609, to six, or to rather to 598, and we read in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 37, that he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar, he comes on the scene, he began imposing his will over Palestine. Of course, he is associated with the nation of Babylon, which is several hundred miles 
uh, to the east of Palestine, okay? And he began imposing his will over Palestine around 605, maybe 606 B.C. In all likelihood, at that time, he was not yet king. So this, I believe, in verse 1, is speaking in an anticipatory uh, uh, fashion. He attacked Jerusalem. He was the head. He was, so to speak, the general of all the, king, of all the armies of Babylon. And he attacked Jerusalem Probably not because Judah or Jerusalem was some great prize or anything like that. But he attacked Jerusalem in the process of defeating the Egyptians. That, uh, that battle took place at Carchemish, which was many hundreds of miles uh, to the north. And the Egyptians had come, had passed through Judea to uh, do battle with the Babylonians. The Egyptians were defeated, and then, then in the process of defeating the Egyptians, the Babylonians swept through Palestine and uh, took over that land, okay? Chasing them through the south, chasing them south through, through Judah. Anyway, in verse 2, we read that the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now, notice here how the writer, Daniel, Notice how he says that this was God's doing. Okay, this was God's doing. Nebuchadnezzar didn't recognize that, of course. He thought that he was doing this on his own. And he thought that he was in charge and he was in control. And he has this mighty army behind him. And he defeated the Egyptians. And he can do pretty much anything he wants. But the Lord is in control. And Daniel recognizes that. And, and, uh, and so he, he, he says that. Uh, The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. And then note here, with some of the articles of the house of God. And Daniel probably would have been familiar with these articles. Maybe not while he was in Judah, but later on when he was in Babylon, maybe he would have had occasion to to look at these articles, at these items, and and realize, of course, these came from my homeland. These actually belong uh, to uh, the Lord. But in harmony, verse 2, in harmony with the theme of the book and the introductory notes, uh, I, I gave you what I believe is the theme of the book of Daniel, that God rules in the kingdoms of men. God rules in the kingdoms of men. And so the Lord gave the southern kingdom to this pagan general. Why would the Lord do that? Well, to punish Israel or to punish Judah for her continual lapses into idolatry. This was all fulfilled in the fulfillment of prophecy. And Jeremiah mentions this in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 14. The reason why Judah went into into captivity. By the way, the book of Habakkuk addresses this this theological conundrum of of God's people uh, in the Old Testament. God's people um, who sometimes they were faithful to the Lord and sometimes they were not. And the people during that time, and Habakkuk as well seems to be, they're questioning God. Why would you allow a terrible, idolatrous, wicked nation to punish your people? Why, why would you do that? I mean, it would be understandable, theologically understandable, that God would raise up a righteous nation and use a righteous nation to punish his people who went into wickedness. But that's not what God does. He uses a nation that is even more wicked, more idolatrous, more pagan than Israel itself. And he uses that nation to punish his people. So um, I, I, it, it causes me to think, you know, America, you know, America. Will God use a nation that is worse than we are? Uh, to punish us, and uh, God, that is, that's God's method of operation um, to do that, and so we should, we should take warning. 
the only salvation for America, the only salvation for Judah, the only salvation for any country is to repent and turn to the Lord. Um, without doing that, then, um, then who knows what will happen. Uh, you'll notice here in verse 2 that uh, uh, Shinar, the land of Shinar, is mentioned. That's just simply another name for Babylon or Chaldea. Chaldea, Babylon, Shinar, same places. Now notice here in verse 2 that Nebuchadnezzar, he stole these items. He lifted them. He, he uh, uh, took these items from the temple of the Lord and he brought them into his service to the service of his God. And his God, the, the, there were many gods of Babylon, but the primary God is Baal. Okay? Another name that is found in their literature is Marduk. Marduk and Baal seem to be the same one. Anyway, he did this, no doubt, as a religious gesture to his God. Okay? I mean, what, what, would, what would please the gods more and Baal more than to trash the temple of a rival god, which would be Jehovah, which would be the, the god of Judah, and take the precious and important items in the temple and present those to your God. Um, that's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing. That's what's on his mind. And so no doubt he did this as a religious gesture to give Bel or Marduk credit for all of his victories. Now we're going to encounter these items that belong in the temple of the Lord. We'll encounter them again in chapter 5. We read in verse 3, then the king instructed Ashpenaz, and this is probably something that, that, uh, that the king did uh, periodically when he would attack different lands and take them over, and he would take captives, the good, and leave the bad behind. And uh, so he probably did this on a different occasions, and he instructed the king, the, he instructed uh, Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants um, and some of the nobles, who are the young men, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking. Okay, I've, I've noticed that it's interesting that uh, the Bible uh, um, takes note of people's physical appearances. Okay, takes notice of Jesus' physical appearance in just a few lines. Um, but uh, think of David, for example, is referred to as young man, good looking. Okay, young man, good looking. Of course, good looking in the eyes of the world, maybe uh, good looking in the eyes of God himself. Okay, and so these young men are referred to as young men. There's no blemish. They're good looking. They're gifted in all wisdom possessing knowledge and quick to understand. They're quick learners, in other words. Quick learners who had ability to serve in the king's palace. In other words, they're sharp. They're on their toes. Uh, they'll do what the king or his staff order them uh, to do and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. In other words, do a little bit of brainwashing here. Okay, Teach them uh, get them to forget about uh, the, the true God. Get them to forget that language and, and the important uh, um, uh, articles and ideas and principles of the law of Moses. Uh, get them to forget those things and uh, adopt. And they do this to young people, not to the older people, because, you know, you can't keep, teach an old dog new tricks, right? Okay, that's always been true. Can't teach an old dog new tricks, so you get the young ones and you teach them. Okay? And so that's what they did. Um, we don't know how many captives were taken to Babylon. Probably thousands. Probably thousands. Why would they just take a hundred or two hundred? Why not take as many as you can uh, to be the servants of your people in, in Babylon? Um, we're told. Um, about a specific command that was issued here, though, to uh, Ashpenaz, the master of the king's units, eunuchs, uh, servants, which would be servants or officers. In, in reading commentaries about what it means to be a eunuch, a lot of times we think, well, a eunuch is someone who's been castrated. 
okay? That's not necessarily so. In the general sense of what a eunuch does is a eunuch is just a special servant of someone in a higher position, okay? Can, can mean the castration, but not necessarily, okay? So we can't say that that is what happened um, to these uh, young men. They were especially trained uh, to serve in the palace, to serve uh, the royal family. And they chose these young men to do that. Now, the young men, the young men here were to be the very best that Judah had to offer, okay? And that's who, that's the description you're reading here in verse 4. Of course, they were to be assimilated. They were to be indoctrinated into the culture and language of Babylon. And this new knowledge, this new training was obviously to take the place of the learning that they had obtained in, in Judah. It is likely, as I noted last week, it is likely since Jehoiakim had not reigned really for very long, and it was in the third year of his reign that Nebuchadnezzar uh, came upon Judah. So it is likely that these men, these young men, and their parents had grown up in the better spiritual environment and revival that was instigated under King Josiah. And we read about that in 2 Kings chapter 22. We read about the reforms, uh, the revival that took place in Judah under King Josiah. Remember the doors of the temple under Manasseh had been closed and everything was dirty and dusty and all of that. And Josiah ordered that the temple of the Lord should be opened up again and as the priests were entering into the, the, the temple, they found the book of the law, you know, lying there in the dirt and in the dust. And they dusted it off and they took the, the book of the law to the king and said, this is the book of the Lord. And Josiah ordered that that book be read in the hearing of all the people. Okay, so Josiah was wanting to get Judah back to where they needed to be. And so the point that I want to make, though, is that in all likelihood, Daniel and the other three young men, and perhaps other young men as well, had grown up during this time of revival and reform. And so their faith in God would have been, undoubtedly, would have been very strong and very intense, okay? Young men taught by their parents, taught by their teachers in, in, during the, the time of King Josiah and had uh, been instilled and indoctrinated in the law of Moses, been educated in the law of Moses. Anyway, we read that the king um, appointed uh, for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies. Okay, these, these young men are going to serve in, in, in the service of the king. Okay, they're going to be doing all of that. And so the king wants these young men to be fed and taken care of and uh, given the best. Okay, they're even, they're, they're going to be getting out of the cupboard of, of the king himself. Okay, you can just imagine um, how tasty and how delicious and how wonderful and rich that food would be. And so... Uh, they were given into this supply. They were offered this supply, the best provisions that Babylon had to offer. Uh, they were to be, of course, the king's elite servants, and so they should serve, receive the very best of provisions, and they would be trained, it says here in the text, for three years for the specific task of serving the king. Maybe one young man would be uh, taught... Uh, uh, some kind of dictation or writing or uh, uh, scribal uh, techniques. And, and others would be taught to serve food. And others would be sought to, to, taught to do accounting or, or whatever. So anyway, all of these specific tasks that you would have in the governance of a kingdom, these young men would be serving in that capacity. Okay? So here you have Daniel uh, serving in, in all of that. Now, verse 6, now among... Uh, from now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel. Okay, so we're introduced here to Daniel, 
this specific young man for the very first time. How old were they? Well, we don't know. I said in the introduction, just kind of a guess, between 13 and 18 years old. Okay, don't know that for sure. They could have been 21. Don't know. Uh, could have been 12, but I don't know. Just in that, probably somewhere in, the, in that range. And so four of these young men are mentioned. Why aren't more young men mentioned? Don't know. We could have kind of a negative interpretation of that, uh, that uh, they weren't up to it. I mean, they weren't uh, up to being faithful to the Lord. Uh, perhaps, we don't know. But these four young men are singled out by Daniel. Daniel's the one that's writing this many, many years later. And he's talking about his friends, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. And as a course of part of their um, re-education, their retraining program, the Babylonian, uh, Babylonian names were given to them. Daniel, which means God is my judge. God is my judge. He was given the name Belteshazzar, which has the word Bel in there. And so Bel protect my life. That's the meaning of that, of that name. Bel protect my life. Hananiah, which means Jehovah is gracious. He was given the name Shadrach, which means command of Aku. Okay? Aku is one of the gods. Um, Michelle, was, which means salvation is of God, was given the name Meshach, um, who, which means who is what Aku. Okay? That's about the best interpretation you can give to that name. Okay? Who is what Aku. And then Azariah, which means the Lord helps, okay? I have a grandson named Ezra, and it's essentially the same name as Azariah. It means the Lord is my help or the Lord is my helper, okay? And he was given the name Abednego, which means servant of Nebo or Nego, okay? However you want to spell that. Okay. So, given pagan names, okay, to replace uh, their names. Okay, so we come here to uh, the faithfulness of Daniel. Uh, not too much is said about them, but, you know, who is it usually that gives your children their names? Who usually gives your children their names? The parents, right? Parents, maybe grandparents have influence in that sometimes, but usually, usually it's parents. Okay. In ancient Israel, in this time, you would give your sons and your daughters a name that reflected, some, that reflected your own faith and your own commitment to the Lord, okay? Look at the names of these guys. They're, 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 they're Hebrew names. Uh, apparently, the, the, their parents are faithful to the Lord and handed down this faith and these principles and these truths to these young men during their growing up years. Isn't that great? That's the way it's to be done. And look what happens in the book of Daniel. Look at these four young men and the great things that they accomplish, how God works in their lives and uses them for his purposes. So we come here to the faithfulness of Daniel, verses 8 through verse 16. Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacy. So you see the setup in verses 1 through 7. He purposed in his heart, he decided that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs, Ashpenaz, that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. This is the second time, okay, God has in, shall we say, intruded himself, involved himself in what's happening here, okay? It was God who directed the affairs of Nebuchadnezzar, taking over the Palestine and taking the captives over into Babylonian. And God is now not just directing the affairs of the kingdoms and of the nations. He is getting involved in the nitty gritty, in the personal lives and events of his people. Okay? So he's, God has his eye on Daniel 
directing what is happening with Daniel. So now God had brought Daniel into the, fair and, uh, into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are uh, your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So there's this, um, so there's this, um, this conversation that's going on between Daniel and Ashpenaz because Daniel has his favor. Okay. Otherwise, Ashpenaz, he's the boss. What he says, that's the way it's going to be. Okay? And he has that kind of authority. You're going to eat this kind of food. You're going to drink this kind of drink. That's the way it is. That's the program that I've set up uh, for you to serve before the king. But he has the favor of Daniel. Okay? He favors Daniel. He likes Daniel. He has the goodwill in mind. And so he's more, this, more of this reasonable tone going on between Daniel and and Ashpenaz. And he gives Daniel this reason in verse 11. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Here's what he said. Please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants." So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies, but they hated that, and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now let's back up here just a little bit, verse 8. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. Daniel appears, um, uh, although four young men are really kind of the focus here, Daniel is the ultra focus, okay? And Daniel appears to take the spiritual lead, but the others are resolved to go along with him, okay? In this objection, conscientious objection, okay? About the king's delicacies. We know that the others did it as well. Uh, based on verses 11 and 12 and verse 15, verses 14 and 15. So what happened, what about all the other young men? Well, it doesn't appear, we don't know for sure, okay, so we'll reserve a little bit of judgment here, but it doesn't appear that they were as resolved as these, um, these four. Uh, anyway, this really verse 8 really sets the tone for who Daniel is and who he is going to be for the rest of his life. You know, there's an important thing that we kind of need to think about. If we think about our children's Bible classes, we think about this class, but more importantly, our children's classes, and not just our classes, but more importantly, what we are teaching our children at home. Think about the fact that you are teaching them principles and ideas, truths, you're teaching them, when you're teaching them God's word and the attitudes and dispositions and approaches that are found in God's word, you are teaching them things that are going to go with them, ideally, that are going to go with them the rest of their lives. You've got problems when we're teaching our children, but then when they become teenagers or they become young adults, they begin changing. They begin changing. And they start picking up the ideas and the principles of the world. And that's, of course, not what we want. We don't want that. What we have to do is we have to start molding and shaping that character when they are very, very small. Because we, the parents, who control their education, who control their training, we are teaching them principles that are going to go with them long after we have left this earth. And they're still here. And they're teaching their children and their grandchildren truths that are going to last a lifetime. They're not going to change. Okay? And that's the great thing about it. Look at the values, look at the principles that are being 
uh, taught in the world right now, everything changes. You notice that? Changes. It changes. How we talk about gender and how we talk about sexuality, how we talk about this. You know, four or five years ago, we're, 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 the world is talking about things right now that it wasn't talking about five years ago. Even five years ago or ten years ago. You know, uh, the, the news and, and it's, a lot of it's fake news and you've got to watch sources and all of that stuff. But isn't it interesting how they can show clips of what our presidents and what our congressmen and women, what they said five years ago and ten years ago, and they wouldn't be caught dead saying it today. That's because their values have changed. What they live by has changed. <laughs> their character seems to have changed too, okay? Not just what they're saying, but also what they really believe uh, seems to be changing too. When I am 20 years old, or I'm 15, or I'm 50, or I'm 80 years old, I ought to be saying the same things, okay? There are some principles that don't change. You teach your 15-year-old that they ought to be teaching, and they ought to be espousing, and they ought to be living by when they're 80 years old, okay? And that's the force of what we're teaching when we're teaching our kids, okay? It stays with them. And they continue to live by those things. They shouldn't change. We don't want them to change. Sometimes people do. They change. But if they're being taught the eternal and great principles of the Lord, then those principles will not change. Maybe they will believe them even more firmly. That's what, that's what our hope is. Even more firmly when they get older. But Daniel, he is talking and he is speaking and his character we're seeing his character in verse 8, okay? This young man, he doesn't change. From a young man to an old man, he's still believing. He's the same guy, okay? It could be 80-year-old Daniel speaking here in verse 8, just as well as 18-year-old Daniel, okay? Isn't that great? The, the power, the longevity of Great principles, divine principles. That's what we're seeing here in, in, in Daniel. He seems to take the lead, like I said. The word that stands out in verse 8 is the word defile. Okay? Defile. The Hebrew word is gale. Gale. Okay? And it simply means to make something dirty. Okay? Okay? Take like a clean shirt or something and drag it through the mud, okay? That would be to defile it, okay? Not religiously, of course, but, but um, this, of course, is referring to kind of a religious and a moral idea here. It simply, though, means to, to make something dirty morally, ceremonially. And when we think about this word, we think back to the law of Moses where the law of Moses said you shouldn't eat certain things. Some things are okay. Here's the, here's the okay list and here's the not okay list. Here are certain things you can drink and here are certain things you couldn't drink. Okay? According to the list that God has given. Now we might look at that kind of scientifically and we might say, well, or, or medically and say, well, I just don't understand this list. This doesn't make any sense at all. But you've got to remember, God said this. So you've got to do it His way. Okay? He makes the rules. He's the king. Okay? He's ultimately the king. Not Nebuchadnezzar. Not Jehoiakim. God is the one who is the king. And he's already given his principles in the law of Moses. He said, I, I want you to eat this, but I don't want you to eat that. We don't know all the things that... We don't, we don't know what's on the king's table okay, here. But, but we're imagining, and, and it's not a, a wild imagination here, that he is offering them things that the law of Moses is probably saying, mm, no, no, this is not what... And Daniel would have known those things, okay? Because he was taught by his parents. He was taught during that time of reform and revile, revival in, in Judah. So he would have known those things. He would have been very familiar with those things. So um, actually, it, it's the only reference that we can imagine as we're reading about Daniel, the only reference point uh, to Daniel, to this young man, 
would be uh, his knowledge of, of God's word. What was the nature of that defilement? We, we don't know. The problem was, 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 was twofold, perhaps. Number one, the provisions did not meet the restrictions, the requirements, and even the preparation requirements of the law of Ma Moses. If you go back and you look at Leviticus chapter 11, Leviticus chapter 17, Deuteronomy chapter 14, multiple places in the law of Moses, the Lord says, don't eat pork, don't eat pork, don't eat rabbit, okay? Don't eat animals that have died naturally or that have been killed by other animals. Um, and, and that's just a short part of the list, okay? There's many, many other things um, that they needed to recognize. Uh, so, so maybe all those things were on the, on the table, okay? Those kinds of things. Uh, the provisions, uh, another problem here perhaps is the provisions were likely the meats and the wines that had been sacrificed to idols, Okay, and God has always wanted us pretty much stay away from those things. Okay, pretty much, pretty much stay away from those things, as Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And another consideration, perhaps these young men, and if this is true, then this is a great observation. Perhaps these young men did not want to become so addicted so involved to the luxury and pleasures of the palace and lose their spiritual focus. Because if these young men are who I believe they are and they have recently come from the highly charged, religious, dedicated uh, environment to the law of Moses in Judah and now they are thrust into this environment of paganism, and sin, and all of that in Babylon, their senses are on high alert. And their thinking, we need to be very, very careful about what we allow ourselves to do. Because we don't want to be a part of this environment. Daniel would have known also, he would have known why his people were taken into captivity. Because of idolatry. Hey, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, very good observation. Thank you for that reminder. That's fantastic. Yes, yes. We need to be in that generation of people who are thinking of the next generation and thinking about training them and teaching them as they need to be taught. Taught the same principles that we're taught and the same principles that we believe. You know, this book never gets old. It never gets old. And the principles, you know, Beth and I, we were talking the other day, I think it was yesterday even, and we were talking about you know, what we need to be teaching children and what we, you know, the kind of influence we need to have on, on children and how, you know, this book, it just, it just never goes, grows old. And the great thing about the Bible is that it touches on all the things that are going on in society today. And you know what? A hundred years ago or 200 years ago, you could have made the same observation. You know, look at how bad society is. Look at all the sin that people are involved in. You know, the Bible talks about those things and it does, it does. You know, our children don't need to learn what's happening in the world and the moral values and principles that they see on television and in sitcoms and, or on social media or whatever. Let me tell you, you want to talk about homosexuality? It's right here. You want to talk about adultery? It's right here. Gossip? You want to talk about it? It's right here. And you, will, you can talk about it from the standpoint of this is what God has to say about that. Okay? We're not hiding uh, these subjects from our children. Let's never do that. Let's not hide from them that adultery happens or homosexuality or, or drunkenness, that that happens. So hide it from our children. 
But let's talk about those things from the standpoint of God's Word. God's Word will give you an education, okay, about what's really going on in the world and will give you God's commentary on those things. Our time is, is up. <clears throat> Thank you very much for being a part of our study. Um, <clears throat> we'll come back to Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 16, and then finish up Daniel chapter 1 next week, if the Lord is willing. And we hope that He is. But continue to read. If you haven't read through Daniel chapter 1, and go into chapter 2 if you'd like. Uh, chapter 2 is also just full of some pretty meaty things there. So thank you all for being a part of our study in our class this morning.